Hey guys, let's keep moving with the third part of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, so the first section is called The Wanderer, and basically all that happens here, Zarathustra is heading back home. Um, so he's climbing over hills to get to the coast where he's going to take a ship back to his mountain. And while, he, while he's walking on the way, he's trying to steal himself with maxims um, for the arduous inner climb he's heading towards. So there's a little bit of imagery there with Zarathustra physically climbing over hills, but the um, it's kind of important that there's a build-up starting here. Um, Zarathustra is kind of building towards some kind of climax, which will take place later. So the next section is on the vision and the riddle. And here he boards a ship, <clears throat> makes it to the coast, boards a ship, and then tells the sailors about a vision he had. And this vision he calls a vision of the loneliest. So this is um, a very important section in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Here he's talking about, um, in the vision, he was climbing upwards. And uh, in doing so, I'll, I'll quote this bit, he was defying the spirit that drew um, me downward toward the abyss, the spirit of gravity. Although he sat on me, half dwarf, half mole. So here Zarathustra or Nietzsche is personifying that force, which we've, which we've already encountered, the spirit of gravity, that force which pulls people down, drags people down, which is um, seriousness, pity, fear, uh, those kind of negative life-inhibiting um, qualities. So he's personifying that that spirit of gravity as this half dwarf, half mole creature, um, and he realizes that the best way to overcome this spirit of gravity is courage, courage which attacks. So Zarathustra confronts confronts the dwarf, and uh, what happens next is where it gets interesting. The dwarf jumps off Zarathustra near a gateway, and this gateway is the moment in time, right? It's, it's the moment, and it symbolizes, this whole passage symbolizes Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence, which is um, important. So the quote for this, which basically explains his doctrine of eternal recurrence, is, from this gateway moment, a long eternal lane leads backward, behind us lies an eternity. Must not whatever can walk have walked on this lane before. Must not whatever can happen have happened, have been done, have passed by before. So here um, Nietzsche is saying that uh, the past stretches out eternally behind us, but also eternally in front of us. And we're, while we're at this, this one point, this moment, um, meet where both of those two eternal lanes kind of meet at the present and um, because it extends forever everything will recur eternally um, we've already existed an eternal number of times in exactly the same state and we will exist eternally um, eternally in this same state, in the future as well. Everything just recycles around. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, a kind of a realization that Zarathustra has here, that um, uh, this, this doctrine of et eternal recurrence, that everything that's happened has already happened an eternal number of times. So it's... Um, how deep do we want to go into this kind of metaphysically? I'm not sure. Is he, is he, is he saying that well, there's only a finite number of atoms, say, in the universe, and um, say with, with multiple big bangs, each of those atoms can only recur, can only, can only form in a, in a finite number of ways. And so eventually, if you wait long enough, those atoms are going to recombine in um, exactly the same configuration which, which, which we're in right now. So we only have to wait 
we'll have to wait a long time, of course, but that's okay because we've got eternity. So, but eventually, those atoms will all come back in the same, um, to the exact same configuration that they're in now. So, this this um, the idea with this, which will which will come up a little bit later, is that this is can be seen as quite negative, right? I mean, if everything that is happening right now has already happened an eternal number of times, and it will happen an eternal number of times in the future, it's kind of like, well, what's the point then, right? I mean, everything's already been done. I've said everything I'm saying right now. I've filmed this video an eternal, eternal, uh, an infinite number of times in the past, and I'm going to do it an infinite number of times in the future. What's the point? So th that's kind of where this idea is is heading. Um, oh, and so on the point of is how how metaphysically um, detailed is, is Nietzsche being here? I think not very. I, I mean, I'd be very surprised if he was trying to make some kind of um, like scientific physics based. Uh, argument here. I don't think that that's not the way Nietzsche works. He's he's kind of proposing this, suggesting it as a as a um, at least a possibility. Uh, and in in Zarathustra, he's presenting it as fact. But again, I don't think he's he's making a scientific argument here. Um, but the the uh, the reason he he has this doctrine of eternal recurrence will become clear as we as we read through um, the book. See, I think I think Nietzsche's not really concerned with with truth in the way that we normally think of truth. He's not trying to uncover um, uh, say what the world is really like in terms of atoms and and forces. For him it's it's more important that um, what we understand of of life is instead life affirming that that that's something that drives us forward rather than something that is say um technically correct maybe is is the way to put it so anyway he's got this doctrine of eternal recurrence he he's presenting it here as a um loosely as a theory just keep that in mind and we'll we'll, we'll revisit this a little bit later um, there are a couple of lesser points which I, I picked up here. Again, I'm not sure if Nietzsche is actually draw, making these points deliberately or if I'm reading too much into it, but it seems to me like he's, he's um, pointing to the, the role of causality uh, when he says, quote, are not all things knotted together so firmly that this moment draws after it all that is to come? Therefore, itself too. So, like, just that kind of inexorable chain of cause and effect. That's how I see that anyway. And I, I think that's, you must have that if you're going to have this idea of the doctrine of eternal recurrence. There has to be this chain of, um, of causality. And the other thing that I thought was interesting is, um, in a way, it's also intimating that whatever can happen must happen uh, and the quote I got here is for whatever can walk in this long lane out there too it must walk once more so whatever can take place on this the, these eternal lanes um, must come back around again so those are two interesting kind of side points which um, are worth considering Again, I don't think we need to go into whether Nietzsche meant this as a scientific theory. I think that's that's going down a, the wrong path. Just take it as as it is. Um, just take it as it's presented here, rather than wondering, you know, what's his what's his reasoning for this? Does he have an argument? Um, yeah, just take it as is. So anyway, suddenly the um, with that with that realization, the dwarf and the gateway disappear, and Zarathustra finds himself on a cliff still in this vision, right, we're still in the vision, 
Uh, there's a shepherd who's writhing and gagging with a with a heavy black snake hanging out of his mouth. Zarathustra tries to pull it out, but he can't. And so he tells the man to bite its head off. Um, following his advice, the shepherd bites the head off the snake, spits it out, and then stands up radiant, changed into something more than human, and laughs. So there, that is... Um, a metaphor which we will revisit at the end of this um, this third part. So just bear bear it in mind, and um, it will it will tie in later. So the next section is called on involuntary bliss, and here Zarathustra um, realizes that he went looking for companions. Right, he he decided not to go to the mass to the masses to the herd. But he, he instead wanted to have companions. But now he realizes, actually, he has to create those companions himself. He's not going to find them. And this, then, is why he is, has chosen to leave them, leave his, his disciples once more, um, to perfect himself for their sake. So he realizes he's lacking. That's kind of the, the, the conclusion of the, the second part. Zarathustra realizes he's not up to this task. And so now he 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 um, he's he's on a mission to perfect himself, and um, so that he can help them uh, become his companions. And the, there's a nice metaphor here of of his disciples as young trees, uh, where he says they are standing close together and shaken by the same winds. But what he wants to do is dig them up and place each by itself. So it may learn solitude and defiance and caution. And um, really, that's just some, that sums up Nietzsche's whole idea of, you know, we need suffering and hardship in order to cultivate ourselves and be the, be the best that we can possibly be, be, be strong, um, dominant, you know, um, and, and express that will to power most capably. Um, cool. So that's that. Next section is Before Sunrise. And I don't have too much to say about this. He just pretty much praises accident, innocence, chance, and prankishness, as opposed to purpose and rationality. He recommends a little, a little reason and a little wisdom as well. But these things, if they are, if they are kind of used in, in an attempt to impose order, on and control reality, then they've um, then we've missed the vital, vigorous, carefree element, nature of of life, of existence, and so that that's what that section's about. Another common recurring theme in Nietzsche and in all of Nietzsche. So the next section is on virtue that makes small. And uh, here Zarathustra gets back to land, but instead of going straight back to his mountain, he decides to take some detours and see what, what some of these people have been up to while he has been away. And it turns out that they've all become small. They've all, they and their virtues have become small and they're getting smaller and smaller. And the reason is um, because of their doctrine of happiness and modesty and virtue which values contentment above all. So he criticizes even those who command, again, for another reason, for a reason we've already seen, because they, um, they've become merely, they, they, they don't rule anymore, they rule with the people. So they, it's the, the quote I've got here is, I serve, you serve, we serve, and woe if the first Lord is merely the first servant. So even the even the rulers have become small; they've shrunk. Um, he continues to criticize kind the kindness, justice, pity that fill the people, um, all in the name again of embracing this happiness, this small kind of shriveled up um, idea of happiness, which he says they call resignation. Um, the quote. For the section I've got is these simpletons want a simple thing most of all. Ah, sorry, want a single thing most of all that nobody should hurt them. They thus they try to please and gratify everybody. Virtue to them is that which makes modest and tame. This is what they call moderation, and Zarathustra calls this 
mediocrity. So just that, that theme that's running through, you know, this the shrinking, he wants to expand strength, um, nobility, that, that's what he calls the noble, you know, that outward kind of drive. Um, these people don't have it. They've gone the opposite direction. Um, another good quote here, that a tree may become great, it must strike hard roots around hard rocks. So there's that you know, suffering again makes someone, um, enables them to be great, to rise above. And he criticizes loving your neighbor as yourself again. Um, we can do whatever we will, but first be such as are able to will. So if you want to love your neighbor as yourself, you first have to know how to love yourself before you can do that. Now, at the end of this section, he talks about a great noon, which is coming. And again, this is a build up. He's kind of Nietzsche's building up to some climactic event, which is going to um, hit Zarathustra later on. The next section is upon the Mount of Olives. Basically, this is an ode to winter, I, I thought, um, who Zarathustra welcomes as a guest. And he says he prefers this hard guest to the pampered, pot-bellied fire idol. I think just, again, praising um, suffering and, and hardness, uh, praising suffering and hardship as um, allowing us to become you know, strong and, and great. The next section is on passing by. And here, just as Zarathustra is about to go into a city, a fool jumps in front of him and bars his way. Um, and the people call this fool Zarathustra's ape. And they do that because he speaks, or he's, he's, um, he's trying to copy the way that Zarathustra speaks, kind of in parables and, and this, this kind of um, metaphorical um, language full of images and... and um, almost flowery way of talking, really. And he tells Zarathustra not to enter the city because there's nothing of value within. He says the people are weak, virtuous, and small. Um, Zarathustra, however, is offended by this, by this ape and says that uh, the fool despises the city, but from a place which is equally desp despicable. So he says when he despises, when Zarathustra despises, he does so out of love, not from petty, vengeful feelings. So he's not engaging in resentment. You know, he's not, he's not, a, he's not taking out, exacting some kind of revenge on people. He is, he is criticizing them because he, he loves them. That, that's what he's saying. It's not coming from a place of um, wanting to get back at them as opposed to this Zarathustra's ape. So he finally says he's nauseated by both the fool and the city and gives the fool one piece of advice as he leaves. Where one can no longer love, there one should pass by. That's a reference back to the, the, the title of the section. So, um, cool. Next section is on apostates. And here... Um, he finds that uh, all those young people who had listened to him many, many years ago when he first came down, they ne they've now gone back to believing in God again and worshipping him. And so Zarathustra calls them apostates and chastises them for their foolishness. Um, he listens to the conversation of a couple of watchmen who doubt, who are doubting God's existence. Um, and he finds this funny because he thinks the time for doubting is long past. This, this is this is something that's um, just self-evident now that, that God is is doesn't exist. So the time for to, to question whether God exists is long gone for him. It's it's a foregone conclusion. Um, but there is an interesting, curious passage worth worth retelling here. He says that he thinks the gods didn't end in a twilight. So they didn't just kind of die out, fizzle out, if you like, kind of um, quietly. Rather, they laughed themselves to death. 
and they laughed themselves to death when one of them said the most godless thing possible. What did he say? He said, there is one God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. And that is to Zarathustra and to the other gods in this little um, parable. That's, that's hilarious because um, there are many different kinds of nobility. Or that, that's the kind of um, the word that we're using for nobility here is, is godliness right, with the gods. So many different kinds of nobility and many different noble people are required so that there can even be a nobility in the first place. So the idea that there could just be one God and thou shalt have no other gods before me, before him, it is is a joke. There's uh, There must be multiple noble um, individuals in order for there to even be a nobility, in order for there to be um, that that level of uh, for there to be godliness you know people individuals at that at that height what um, I guess Nietzsche's Nietzsche would refer to as the ubermensch um, so finally he leaves this town and is now just two days away from his mountain and his cave and uh, the return home is the next section where Zarathustra gets back and rejoices in the clean, quiet air, remarking how um, different it is from the noisy, musty air of the cities that people live in. And the next section, I'm just going to run through two more for this video. The next section is on the three evils. And here he has a dream in which he weighs the world on scales and surprisingly finds it good, finds it humanly good. And... Um, I assume what he's talking about here when he says humanly is that good from the perspective of the humans living in it, from, from people. So he finds it good for people. And on waking, he decides to try and balance this out in reality, see if it, see how he can um, you know, tip, tip the scales a little bit. So he tries to identify the three most evil things in the world and weigh them humanly as well. So the, the three things are sex, the lust to rule, and selfishness. And regarding sex and the lust to rule, he talks about how they, um, how they appear from different perspectives. So we're, again, we're looking at this from these humanly, um, a human perspective. So sex is a thorn and stake for the despisers of the body. Right. It, remember, we talked about chastity. It's uh, sex is, is something bad for those who who disparage the more the mortal, the the earthly, the this the physical. But on the other hand, it's innocent and free for free hearts. Um, and the same with the lust to rule. It can be a scourge, but it can also ascend to the heights. So it can be a bad thing in the wrong kind of person, but it can be a good thing in the right person as well. As for selfishness, Zarathustra finds that this is actually good. He calls it blessed, wholesome, and the attitude of a powerful soul, a self-enjoying soul. <clears throat> and we've seen this before when um, you know, Zarath um, Nietzsche has talked about selfishness as being something positive and he wishes that more acts were done and what were committed in which the self was present fully in those acts. And, uh, and he says that that's, when that happens, the act automatically becomes good. Um, so he says selfishness creates good and bad for itself and banishes from its presence whatever is contemptible. Um, and of course, for those, those people who he considers... You know, the herd, the rabble, what's selfishness for them? It's a vice. They value the opposite. So for him, it's a positive thing. Um, and again, at the end of this section, he, he foretells the coming of this great noon, which will be some kind of um, revelation for him. So the final section I'm going to hit here is called On the Spirit of Gravity. And here he's um, 
And we, I, another theme we've encountered more than once. The spirit of gravity makes life and earth seem grave. It's seriousness. To overcome this, we must become light and love ourselves. Um, although this isn't the, the love of the wilting and the wasting. One must learn to love, love oneself, but with a wholesome and a healthy love. So um, it's funny to hear Nietzsche talk, because you know he talks so much about... Um, um, warring and, and aggressiveness and and selfishness and then suddenly he switches and he's talking about love um, and, and lightfulness and, and playfulness and joy but um, but these things weren't opposites for Nietzsche they, they came together I mean it's not that not that not, not even that joy and and prankishness has this darker side it's just that these things are um, they're not opposite. They're not opposed to each other. It's possible to to have a heart full of love, while one is um, attacking one's enemies, and attacking them honestly and openly, demanding that they um, that you know that they be accountable for their values, for their opinions, confronting them directly. So these these things for Nietzsche, as long as they're done in in a particular in a certain um, from a certain from a certain mindset, I guess, from a certain perspective, um, then they they they're positive. They're not. There's no clash here between joy and selfishness, for example. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so he so he's got this this. Uh, we must become light and love ourselves, but not this this weak kind of petty love. Um, and again, he criticizes the love of the neighbor. For the same reasons. Uh, now he says, grave words and grave values surround us from birth. And these, in this he's referring to good and evil. The words good and evil. And he says, like a camel, the spirit loads itself with these alien grave words and values and makes of life a desert. So the camel, we're, we're referring back to the very beginning of the book. Where the three metamorphoses again, the camel, the lion, the child. So um, we, uh, like, a li like a camel, we load ourselves with the, this baggage, the, these burdens of preordained values, right? preordained morality, which we just, we, we just um, operate under instead of defining ourselves and creating our values ourselves. He changes tack a little bit here and talk, talking about um, what he calls the omni-satisfied. And this he's using, uh, he, he's talking about those who consider everything good and this world the best possible world. So this is almost certainly a reference to Leibniz who, who said that this world, because God is, is all-powerful and all-good, this world must be the best best of all possible world worlds, um, so he's criticizing that these omni satisfied people um, because they're not choosy. They don't pick what is right for them and, and discard the rest. They just take in everything and say and 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 just try and 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 change it so that it's all positive. It's all good for them, and that's not what Nietzsche is about. Right? Nietzsche is about asserting yourself. Deciding what you like and what you don't like, not just this weak kind of um, oh, everything's good for me. I like everything. He wants someone who knows what they like, someone who's who's not afraid to um, pick from the banquet of life, pick and choose. So he says uh, he values those who choose the values that they will honor themselves. I'm just repeating myself, right? Um, the one who refutes a universal good for all, evil for all. And rather says, and this is quite nice, I think this quote, this is my good and evil. Um, and then he says, in addition to this, there's not just one way to one's truth. So first of all, the truth is relative. Your, your, your morality is your own morality. You, you create that. Um, it's your good and evil, and this is my good and evil. But in addition to that, 
the way does not exist. That does not exist. Rather, we should say, this is my way. Where is yours? So again, he's, he's, he's not prescribing a, um, <clears throat> a set of values or a pathway that we have to follow. He's saying, create your own. You, you've got to decide what's good for you, and you've got to um, stand behind that. That's, that's your task in life. The child, creating for yourself. So that's um, halfway through the second part, and um, we'll continue. Uh, sorry, halfway through this third part, and we'll continue with with this in the next video. Again, I, I hope you get you're getting something from this. I hope it's it's all making sense. I think that there's quite a bit of repetition, but um, um, it's good for me too, right? The more I say it, the deeper it sinks into my into my head. So anyway. Thanks for listening, and I'll, uh, I'll catch you next time.